Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the initial management and uh, initial evaluation, sorry, and management of uh, musculoskeletal tumors um, for the general orthopedic surgeon. Um, today, we have uh, three speakers. Um, each will have a uh, specific topic. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, benign bone tumors. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hanak Waldi Smite will be talking about soft tissue tumors, and Dr. Timothy Rapp will be talking about uh, the management of uh, metastatic disease. And so uh, without further ado, I'll uh, start. Uh, so my name is Dr. Masrua. I'm assistant professor of orthopedic surgery with subspecialty training in musculoskeletal oncology and pediatric orthopedics. And I work at NYU. Um, I'll be talking about the benign bone tumors. So, uh, so let's get started. So I, a lot of textbooks might uh, uh, divide benign bone tumors into uh, different categories based on their pathology. But as orthopedic surgeons, we, we uh, see the patient and we see imaging uh, rather than slides. So it's easy to, easier, I think, to divide it according to behavior. So uh, benign bone tumors can be divided into latent, active, and aggressive uh, tumors. And these are some of the uh, um, examples of those. And then you have MHE as the hereditary. Sorry, Olia and Mafuchi are not hereditary. They, they should be separate. But, uh... So benign latent tumors usually are asymptomatic and they're found incidentally. They have a narrow zone of transition on x-ray, so very geographic. There's usually no soft tissue mass or extension, so that's another clue, and no periosteal reaction. And they usually don't require any treatment, including biopsy. Uh, however, there are circumstances, and I'll show some examples where treatment may be necessary. And so non-ossifying fibroma is probably the most common one we see. We see it in most children who come in with ankle and knee sprains and uh, get x-rays, and, and it appears on their imaging. Uh, sometimes uh, patients present with pain without uh, any injury, and uh, that's when these lesions are, are a little bit larger. So um, overall, these are eccentric metaphyseal lesions, as you can see on these x-rays. They have the soap bubble appearance, and most of fibr fibrous tumors do have this soap bubble appearance. Um, as I mentioned, they're incidental. And usually surgery is reserved for those patients who develop, who have a fracture or uh, have chronic pain with more than 50% of the cortical involvement. And so there's an example of a patient who ended up getting surgery, 17-year-old uh, linebacker, had a lot of pain, wasn't able to uh, continue participating, um, had this imaging with the MRI showing uh, some stress reaction. So the patient underwent surgery with uh, curtage and grafting with bone substitute and uh, subsequently did very well, healed um, his lesion and is uh, uh, back to playing uh, football. However, as you know, most of the time it's incidental and can be observed. Uh, and chondromas, they're usually metaphyseal or diaphyseal. They have this sort of popcorn appearance. And so looking at the matrix is very important. Um, they are frequently incidental. Uh, many, many um, people who, part, who practice uh, in sports medicine uh, get MRIs or x-rays of the shoulder or the knee and uh, see these incidentally. Um, it's also the most common bone tumor in the hand, but it appears differently in the hand. It can, it's mostly lytic. Uh, it's difficult to differentiate from a low-grade chondrosarcoma uh, or rather a uh, atypical chondroid tumor. Um, and that's one of the, of the problems with this type of lesion. And uh, even biopsies can be uh, difficult to uh, elucidate the exact diagnosis because parts of it may be more benign than others. And so it's usually a combination of uh, imaging appearance, how aggressive it is, in addition to symptoms that might guide treatment. And there's an example of a patient with painful enchondroma in her fingers. Uh, these are her x-rays and MRI, uh, underwent curtage and healed them well and uh, became asymptomatic. Osteochondromas in adults are uh, latent lesions. They, uh, they're not, they don't change very much, but sometimes they can cause uh, symptoms and can be painful. And in that case, uh, you may want to remove it after uh, um, uh, evaluating it with an x-ray and possibly an MRI, uh, particularly, for example, in this case, uh, to elucidate the um, proximity to the vessels and the relationship with the vessels. Um, frequently, we get patients who uh, have irritated bursa secondary to uh, compression. And so um, 
when patients have these lesions, if you tr- decide to follow them and treat them non-operatively, uh, it's important to uh, let them know that if there's any growth uh, during adulthood, uh, then they should come back because that might uh, signify uh, transformation. And MRI appearance with more than two centimeter thick cartilage cap is also another indicator that it had transformed into malignancy. So the benign active uh, tumors gen- tend to be symptomatic. They're, geogra- they're still geographic. There's usually some well-ordered periostal reaction when they're symptomatic. There's no, no soft tissue mass again, and uh, they may or may not have a matrix. Uh, and so examples could be osteoid osteoma, unicameral bone cyst, fibrous dysplasia, and EG. EG can actually uh, behave in, in any manner. It can also behave aggressively and usually treat based on symptoms. So UBCs are very common. They tend to be uh, central, uh, expand through the width of the bone, uh, usually not wider than the physis adjacent to it in young children. Um, and that's the difference, how to differentiate it sometimes on imaging from a ABC. Um, fractures in the proximal humerus should be left alone uh, unless they sim- sim- continue to be symptomatic and recurrent. Um, or if there's an impending fracture after it heals. And these have a high recurrence rate in younger patients, so usually under the age of 10 and those adjacent to the physis. And the reason is most likely uh, because uh, when, when they're treated with curatage, uh, the, most surgeons are hesitant to be more aggressive against the physis. As an example of a teenager uh, who had uh, persistent pain after getting a hip arthroscopy for a labral tear, um, was found to have this persistent um, bone cyst with a minimally invasive approach. Um, the cyst was opened and grafted and the patient became asymptomatic. Osteodosteomas are very important and, and can be easily missed. Um, and so uh, they're technically non-neoplastic, although it's a tumor, but there are no abnormal cells uh, really. Um, they typically, typically have night pain, um, most frequently around the proximal femur. Uh, it could be in the spine. And when they're in the spine, they can develop a secondary scoliosis, which is usually broad. Um, they improve on NSAIDs, uh, and treatment could uh, it varies. Uh, it could involve injection of corticosteroids, uh, sorry, uh, injection of uh, ablation or from or curtage. Um, surgery can be difficult to treat in some areas, and, and that's when ablation can be helpful. So, as an example of a 15 year old female patient who had persistent left pain, hip pain, again, after a hip arthroscopy for a labral tear, um, repeat MRI uh, after the arthroscopy showed uh, the, the, this lesion, which in retrospect was present previously, and a CT scan confirmed the diagnosis. And so the treatment is again, percutaneous ablation. And so this paper came out in March, 2019 at uh, in JBGF, just JBGS that uh, showed that there was an alternative diagnosis in 46% of patients with uh, osteodosteoma about the hip, and most of the, most commonly it was FAI. So almost all of these patients had the the, the history suggestive of osteodosteoma. Fibrous dysplasia, usually metaphyseal, can extend into diaphysis. It can involve the whole bone uh, sometimes, especially around the humerus. Um, it has this ground glass appearance. Um, it can be associated with McCune and Albright's uh, McCune and Albright syndrome. So it should be uh, his, uh, appropriate history should be taken. Uh, surgeries are performed for fractures. Uh, it's important to understand that cancellous bone graft tends to be resorbed, so it shouldn't be used. And cortical struts uh, could possibly be used in their place because they take longer to resorb. Um, when sur- when uh, surgery is, is, is uh, planned uh, for to correct deformity, uh, an intramedullary device is usually recommended. Eosinophilic granuloma can be uh, very tricky to diagnose and sometimes difficult to treat. It's a great mimicker. It uh, has these associated conditions, uh, particularly uh, Hans Schiller Christian with uh, uh, diabetes insipidus. Uh, They tend to resolve on their own after a biopsy or curatage, and um, they they tend to do well in younger patients. One of the potential options is also injecting corticosteroids uh, within the lesion. So is it? 12 year old kickboxer who had right knee pain, knee x-ray was fine. As with all children, you should look higher up when they have knee pain. And that's where the lesion was uh, noted. And uh, MRI appearance uh, was fairly typical for a eosinophilic granuloma, although this is also a location where Ewing sarcoma might uh, be seen. There's another patient with a similar lesion. Uh, the image on the left is pre-op, the image in the middle is immediately post-op, and then uh, several months later after everything healed. 
Osteochondromas in children are uh, more active. And in younger patients, you probably should consider a skeletal survey to rule out MHE. Um, and uh, you, we tend to try to avoid surgery until skeletal maturity, but sometimes symptoms dictate uh, and guide us. And so this is an example of a much younger patient who turned out to have MHE. The benign aggressive uh, lesions are almost always symptomatic. They have uh, a neocortex that forms, they're lytic, um, they occasionally have a soft tissue mass. And these are the only five benign aggressive lesions. So when you see that on x-ray, these are the five that you need to think about. And then the appearance and history can help tell you which one it is. For example, aneurysmal bone cysts, you see the fluid fluid levels on MRI. Uh, if uh, there are limited fluid fluid levels and there's a component that's, that doesn't appear to be fluid fluid levels, uh, telangic tantic osteosarcoma needs to be ruled out. Um, about 30% of ABCs arise from other tumors. And uh, like all um, benign aggressive tumors, they need to be treated with extended intralegional curettage. And that means using any adjuvant that you uh, have at your disposal. Uh, this includes uh, high-speed burr, uh, argon beam, liquid nitrogen, phenol alcohol, though that's not used very frequently anymore. And this is exam an example of a patient um, with uh, proximal femur ABC um, treated with curettage grafting and flexible nailing. There's a younger patient with ABC of the distal tibia treated with extended curettage with a burr argon beam and grafting. Uh, as you can see, it's very close to the physis, and so that's always a concern. So close follow-up is important. As you can see on follow-up, uh, the patient uh, had uh, growth and preservation of uh, the growth plate. Osteoblastoma, uh, you know, the, the most, most are not very aggressive, but they can be very symptomatic. Um, these are different from osteoid, osteo, osteoid osteoma in, in relationship to their size. Some of them can have a secondary ABC. This is a patient with an osteoid osteoma that developed after, sorry, an osteoblastoma that developed after an osteoid osteoma was treated initially with ablation, but then persisted and grew. And so this patient was treated with curettage and grafting. The patient had developed a secondary valgus deformity that was corrected at the same time with hemiac physiodesis. Chondroblastoma, uh, these tend to be epiphyseal. So when you see an aggressive lesion in the epiphysis, lots of edema, uh, and joint effusion, then uh, you, you should think of a chondroblastoma, particularly in a patient who's not skeletally mature. Uh, as you will see ne next, in those who are skeletally mature, you would think of a giant cell tumor. Typically, uh, in symptomatic patients, you would treat with curettage and grafting, and most patients are symptomatic. And this is a patient who was treated with grafting, and then three months post-op, the graft resorbed. And this is a, a similar patient in the proximal femur, um, through a lateral approach was uh, had the curettage grafting and uh, did well post-op with a, a resolution of their symptoms. Um, this is a, an important distinction that needs to be made. So in a, in a three-year-old female with this lesion and limping, uh, it's important to uh, rule out uh, an osteomyelitis. So in this patient, this patient has rim enhancement. And so when there's rim enhancement, osteomyelitis should be ruled out or considered rather, uh, rather than a bone tumor. CMF is not very commonly seen. Uh, when you see an aggressive lesion that's eccentric um, in the metaphysis and has a, somewhat of a soap bubble appearance, um, the CMF needs to be considered. Uh, you can do a biopsy to confirm. Um, unlike NOF, patients are typically symptomatic and they're a little bit older. There's a patient uh, in, their in their 20s uh, who had this symptomatic lesion and their proximal uh, humerus that was curated turned out to be a CMF. Did well after curettage. There's another one that's more subtle in the proximal uh, fibula, uh, extremely symptomatic, very painful. The patient was a runner, he couldn't run anymore. Um, had this appearance on MRI, again, eccentric, uh, thinning of the cortex and some edema and underwent curettage and grafting. Uh, with a resolution of their symptoms. And so giant cell tumor is also epiphyseal, like uh, a chondroblastoma. And uh, however, giant cell tumors tend to be more aggressive. They extend into the metaphysis from the epiphysis and can develop a soft tissue component. There usually is a neo neocortex formation, and sometimes it's very subtle on an x-ray, and you need a CAT scan to see that. So typically the management, like with other uh, 
benign aggressive tumors. It's with uh, uh, extended intralesional curettage with cement or bone graft or bone substitute. I tend to use bone substitute. Um, cement with cement, you can see local recurrence pretty easily. Um, uh, each each adjuvant doesn't have a added benefit from another from the other, although they do have added benefits then from curettage on its own. This is an example of a patient in their 30s who developed a, a pain around the ankle and this lesion on imaging was biopsied found to be a giant cell tumor, curetted, and then around a year uh, later developed a local recurrence. So that's one of the things that you need to make sure that you do with patients who have these lesions and are treated, that they have a close observation to uh, look for recurrence. And then you can treat them similarly with a very aggressive uh, interlesional curettage and grafting. And... Um, and then you follow them up again. So take home points are benign latent are asymptomatic, don't usually require treatment. Benign active can be symptomatic, geographic, don't usually have a soft tissue mass. Um, and treatment depends on symptoms, whereas the benign aggressive uh, are typically epithelial, metaphysiolytic, uh, and develop in your cortex and need to be treated with extended curettage. So MHE is the hereditary one that I had previously mentioned. Um, they grow away from uh, the physis. The important thing is to follow these patients up, uh, particularly if, if there's growth after skeletal maturity. Frequently, they can also develop deformities that need to be addressed. Um, as you can see here, uh, patients also uh, undergo multiple surgeries to treat uh, their osteochondromas uh, throughout their life. MRIs, around, especially around the pelvis, can be important uh, in order to distinguish uh, osteochondromas that are stable from those who, those that are growing and potentially developing a thickened cartilaginous cap, which may suggest uh, transformation to a, a low-grade chondrosarcoma. Uh, the forearm uh, is frequently involved and develops deformities, and this is a classification uh, that's frequently used and helps guide treatment. So all your mafuchi, as I mentioned, these are not hereditary, uh, but worth mentioning. Um, they are usually sporadic inheritance. Mafuchi different, differentiates from OLEA in that they have additional hand and foot soft tissue hemangiomas. These are patients who have multiple enchondromatoses and uh, develop uh, uh, deformities secondary to, to these uh, enchondromatoses and uh, require treatment such as limb lengthening and deformity correction. Um, it's important to look for malignant transformation. So any change in size, uh, the pain development of pain should be uh, taken seriously and these patients should be followed up regularly. There's no clear cut uh, method of follow-up, uh, but it's well known that uh, more central lesions can transform. And so these should be followed up more closely, possibly with annual MRIs. Um, you can treat with uh, curettage and grafting, uh, particularly if uh, fractures uh, need to be treated as they have, they're predisposed to that as a patient who developed uh, you know, multiple deformities and limb length discrepancies and required multiple treatments uh, to, to develop equal limb lengths and uh, correct their deformity. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, the next presenter is, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Hanok waldi -Simet. He's going to be talking about soft tissue tumors in the musculoskeletal system. Take it away. Great. Thank you, uh, Karine. Can you hear me uh, well? I can hear you. Okay, great. Wonderful. So I'm going to assume our, um, our audience can hear me too. Thank you for joining us and uh, for uh, your continued interest in this uh, series of talks. Uh, <clears throat> my subject is uh, soft tissue tumors and uh, particularly the workup, because as you will see, um, it could be quite an extensive list of uh, lesions. And so what we will uh, cover is, you know, what I and my colleagues generally do and in general, what we would recommend so that you can stay out of trouble. Um, so generally speaking, these lumps, and I'm sorry about the formatting of the slides, you'll see, I uh, noticed, unfortunately, that there may be some cutoff of the topics, but we'll be talking through this, so um, you'll understand where I'm going with this. Uh, this picture is supposed to just, um, you know, show you some level of the variety of cases that will present through your offices for various issues. As you can see, it can range from ganglion cysts to... Uh, legitimate soft tissue uh, uh, tumors. And by, by saying legitimate, uh, you know, I'm also referencing on the right, 
which we, uh, most orthopedists would recognize as more of a bursitis rather than an actual, you know, neoplastic uh, process, um, uh, you know, or a tumor or a soft tissue in particular. They may present to your office in various uh, sizes and shapes and locations. Uh, some will be superficial and some will be deep. Uh, some of the deeper ones will be in very uh, concerning areas where there is a neurovascular bundle uh, near the groin, near the popliteal fossa. And a lot, of a lot of this has to do with the fact that there is no specific area that you will find soft tissue uh, tumors. They are a very heterogeneous group, and it's remarkable to me that we even uh, <clears throat> we can describe them as being consisting of you know 300 benign types of benign neoplasms and a hundred different malignant subtypes. But the World Health Organization has categorized them, and you'll see various charts like this in most of the sort of. Uh, oncologic books describing the various types and their differences and the aggressive version versus the benign version. So, you know, in short, um, you're not dealing with a very uh, homogeneous type of uh, uh, tissue uh, group. Uh, soft tissue tumors can be lipomas. And if we talked about lipomas, it's not necessarily that it would be one type of lipoma where it's just sort of a mature adipose tissue completely. Sometimes we find angiolipomas, fibrolipomas, uh, you know, and not necessarily uh, something that you may find in advance of your excisions or resections. So uh, that will be sort of uh, one of the points of the discussion uh, moving forward. So as you see, you know, even the benign hemangiomas and the desmoids and the myxomas, they all have variants. And um, it's just about knowing what exactly you're dealing with and, uh, and how to proceed forward. I am a big fan of embryology. I think knowing your origin, just like in life, knowing your history, you kind of have an idea of what exactly you're dealing with. These are tissues that are different than your, you know, what you might be accustomed to with adenocarcinomas. These are, uh, these these are derived from the mesenchymal or the mesoderm, which is you know, where during the just shortly after <clears throat> fertilization, and the egg, the implantation, and gastrulation. What you'll find is that the 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 egg, the fertilized egg, breaks into three germ cells, which then just sort of spawn off um, all the tissues that we're familiar with, and it's that mesoderm that then um, goes on to uh, give us all the sort of soft tissue and connective tissue that we're very familiar with. Now, uh, as you can see, the mesen mesenchymal stem cells can go on to uh, lead to the development of many types of organs. So do you call any type of growth in any of these other organs soft tissue? Not really. For our purposes, a soft tissue tumor is a, is a tumor that is extraskeletal, uh, you know, outside the system of the neurologic system or the parenchymal cells of the lungs or the liver and, uh, and the glia. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about soft tissue tumors, I'm not talking about the pancreas here. We're, we're talking about extraskeletal mesenchymal tissue. So just to get the definitions uh, out there. Well, you know, what determines benign versus uh, malignant? Well, benign tumors are usually represented by a you know, cells and a process that, that show you limited capacity for growth. You know, they grow, uh, but, you know, they either have uh, a good uh, capsule or they show you, uh, uh, you know, cells that are less bizarre than the more malignant counterparts, okay? Uh, you know, the very, you know, features that describe and diagnose a, a malignant tumor is that they are... Uh, hard to control. They grow beyond boundaries. They have aggressive, uh, you know, cells that are pleomorphic, abnormal looking, you know, and they, uh, and these cells tend to be dividing rapidly. They, uh, you might see mitosis in the, in the field of, of view. Uh, and so, and then it's not just growth, but they can uh, metastasize and, uh, you know, eventually have a, an effect on life. So, you know, you've got these benign soft tissue lesions, these malignant versions, and then um, then you've got everything else in, in between, you know, there, there are many types of pseudo tumors, you know, and, and pseudo tumors have to be, has to be used carefully nowadays in orthopedics. 
pseudotumor can possibly mean uh, reactive tissue around joints, uh, joint replacement implants particularly. But in particular, I am talking about these sort of lumps and bumps that you come across from your patients who might not really be a neoplastic process, such as a myositis ossificans, as, as you may be familiar with, due to trauma and bleeding into the you know, nearby musculature. Infections, you know, you, there, there are patients who are prone to uh, spontaneous infections or may have uh, systemic diseases that uh, make them prone uh, to uh, infections and uh, reactions like granulomas or, or foreign body reactions, patients who might have had an injury, uh, you know, an injury to the skin that has indwelling foreign body and a reaction around that. So uh, it's not always a neoplastic process that uh, these pseudo tumors, uh, you know, represent the class of uh, lesions you may find. Epidemiology is always an interesting thing. It's hard to characterize and define what could be such a wide variety or a class, you know. When we look at our data and so in terms of incidents, uh, you know, we have some idea with relative frequency of what presents in the office. You know, we know that benign soft tissue neoplasms are in order of, you know, more common 200 to 1 uh, compared to the sarcomas, okay? We know that sarcomas tend to occur in older patients. So when a young person presents with a lump or bump, uh, we don't necessarily need to, um, you know, escalate things and just talking to them. We can tell them, listen, we're going to, you know, do our, our, our workup and, and get to the bottom of it. But, you, you know, it's all about how you present and talk to your patients. You can, uh, you know, you don't need to eliminate sarcoma in a younger patient, soft tissue uh, tumors in, in particular, but you can at least do the workup, uh, which I'll get into before you start presuming any other. Whereas in an, in an older person, you've got a larger uh, mass and a lower extremity or a large muscle group in general, you know, you tend to find sarcomas usually in the extremities. Uh, that's, that's not to say that they're not found in the abdomen or retro, retroperitoneal or even in the head and neck. But, uh, you know, the sarcomas that we deal with in orthopedics or, or mus as musculoskeletal tumors surgeons, you know, you tend to find them more in the extremities. But, you know, every one of these tumors, the various types, expresses different kind of behavior and might sometimes be predicated uh, on, on being associated with particular tissue. For instance, angiosarcomas tend to be near, uh, you know, wherever there's a blood vessel and that originates from there. So um, this is just a breakdown. And, and this data particularly is from the uh, recent uh, publication from the Rizzoli uh, Institute in Italy, where uh, they show you over, uh, you know, decades of cases uh, the distributions that they've had with soft tissue tumors, you know, malignant, you know, being liposarcoma being one of the most common types and synovial sarcomas. Uh, and then, you know, in relative comparison, in terms of the benign lesions, um, they, uh, you know, the lipomas and the hemangiomas and the nerve sheath tumors like the schwannomas being the, the more common in that regard. What is the pathogenesis for the soft tissue tumors? Well, I don't think it really differs so much from the bone tumors uh, as well, you know. So, you know, there are some thoughts in this uh, in this regard. Uh, history of trauma can be associated, particularly with myositis ossificans. Does you know fibromatosis has also in the past been associated with trauma? But really, you know, this is where um, you know anecdotal evidence needs to be um, juxtaposed to evidence-based medicine. There is no uh, significant history or correlation of trauma with a, a, a huge number of the soft tissue masses that we're talking about. There are substances, toxic, uh, that are considered sarcogenic, you know, the hydrocarbons and herbicides uh, that are known to cause uh, the development of soft tissue tumors. Radiation um, has always been associated, you know, and the interesting thought is that actually, when you look at the data, the radiation associated with treatment of patients for neoplastic purposes, you know, only, a, you know, less than 1% of those patients go on to develop uh, radiation-induced sarcomas or malignancies. Of course, it all depends on what age they get it. A younger patient who gets radiation has a higher risk of, uh, uh, you know, radiation-induced uh, 
sarcomas than someone who's older. You know, they have a longer lifespan and at any point that radiation can inflict um, issues. An interesting association with soft tissue tumors is its association with viruses. You know, I think we're all familiar with Kaposi sarcoma and its involvement in, our, in patients uh, with HIV. Uh, it also has a lot to do with T-cell lymph uh, T-cell development and uh, um, you know pro proliferation. Uh, that's becoming less common uh, now that we are able to manage our AIDS patients at nearly undetectable virus levels. Uh, but there are reports with scanning electron microscopes showing viruses. You know, some of the thoughts and theories behind that is that these viruses shed their DNA and uh, uh, or RNA, and then and it goes into cells, and it causes the genes to change, and then um, you know, and warp into a tumor. It's funny; it's by that same mechanism that we are trying to uh, heal people too. You know, introducing viruses and and uh, carrying some significant. Uh, gene-altering DNA to help patients. So by uh, that same token, um, you know, it, it's uh, associated with the development of um, um, soft tissue tumors. Are there genetic causes? Yes, obviously there are genetic causes. You know, there are onco, uh, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that can be either de defective or, um, you know, they... Uh, they're going to overdrive or, or they underproduce. And in so many ways, the mutations can amplify the gene uh, and, uh, and cause soft tissue sarcoma. So genetic uh, considerations also have to be uh, uh, taken. So, uh, you know, what I've given you thus far is just uh, the very, the, how these things occur in the first place, how, how widely variable their presentation may be. So what are you going to do, you know, when, when they present uh, in, in the office. So the, the first thing, and I, and I hate to make it an island so elementary, but really the history makes a big difference. You know, when you speak to the patient and, and you realize that this, this mass has been present for quite an extended period, you, you tend to, you know, even though you may not want to express it right away, you can be reassured that, you know, it's most likely to be a benign lesion. Obviously, there are some rare circumstances uh, where you could be misled by that. You know, synovial sarcoma is is one of those uh, malignant tumors that may have uh, had an, an extended history with the patient and may have a more recent growth, you know. So uh, what about the rate of growth? You can ask the patient about that. You know, fastly growing tumors tend to be um, problematic, you know, more in line with an aggressive lesion, sarcoma possibly. You know, it's hard for patients sometimes to appreciate growth. You know, if it's, if it's a deep lesion, it's sort of like the, you know, uh, it's like the tip of the iceberg. You know, you don't really know what's below. So uh, that's just a little foreshadowing of what I think is really crucial in these uh, circumstances. Is there pain associated with this mass? You know, it, it, and it's, it can be a knee-jerk knee reaction to just sort of say, hey, you've got a mass, go get an MRI. And I guess as long as you are, you know, more curious and to get into this, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, it's not always the case. Uh, but the more you can document, the better it is. It can help you figure out as to what is more important needs to be expedited versus uh, what can be watched clear carefully. Pain associated with the mass tends to be more along the line of a very painful lesion, potentially more uh, malignant. Uh, acute pain, usually it can be associated with bursitis, various musculoskeletal uh, issues around the mass. You know, these, these tumors, you know, sometimes benign and malignant, can cause uh, you know neighboring tissues to be uh, irritated and inflamed, and so acute pain can be just you know hemorrhage from local tissue, whether it's a benign tissue or not. So I don't particularly think that, that itself gives me too much to work on. Uh, obviously, acute pain in a very large mass could be necrosis, and that's what it tends to be more associated by. Pain at night tends to be uh, something we. Uh, think is pathognomonic for a more malignant process. It has a lot to do with the hormonal change, circadian rhythm, you know, history of trauma, uh, especially in a young patient. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, sarcomas tend to be more common in the older population. Uh, but, you know, the history of trauma lets you know that this is maybe a different process, more along the type of, uh, you know, myositis of or so, you know, 
personal or family history of, uh, of, of cancer in general. Uh, you know, um, my colleague, Dr. Masruha mentioned Mafuchis. You know, if, if you have a history of, of known tumors, soft tissue, particularly in that case, hemangiomas, you may have, you may be more prone. So that's something you'd probably know early on. Um, sarcomas have been known to run in families. There are specific genes that are associated with that, probably beyond the scope of this, but it's all part of the documentation. If there's a family history, family you know, is known to have particularly rare tumors, it's something that you may want to highlight and, uh, and either, uh, you know, bring up to your uh, orthopedic oncology co uh, colleagues or um, refer out. Obviously, systemic system symptoms such as generalized malaise, weight loss are also all signs of the history that you should uh, take note of. Obviously, physical exam, you know, uh, put your hands on the patient, feel, find out whether this is a, a very, you know, discrete mass. Can you tell where it starts and begins? Uh, is it firm? Is, is it mobile? Is it dense? Is it soft? Is it, is it compressible? Uh, these are all things that sort of help understand. Uh, obviously, none of it really on physical exam can be very specific. You know, the physical exam is sensitive in, in identifying some things, but not very specific. Um, you know, in one area, you know, if you if you examine the lymph nodes, you may be um, you may find that you might you you have uh, lymph lymphadenopathy, uh, and that's more associated with some of the sarcomas. You know, most sarcomas do not spread to the lymphatics, but there are some that are more commonly, uh, as you see on the slide, synovial sarcomas, epithelioids, rhabdomyosarcomas, clear cells. So you're you're not going to find this on physical exam, but it's still worth doing a, a and lymph node examination. Now, what I find in my practice, and I, I put this slide up a lot when I give these talks, is that I have patients that show up with these lumps and bumps. And, uh, you know, when I tell them sort of the plan of workup, they just sort of say, well, can't you, you know, can't you just get this thing out for me? And, and this is the, the doctor pimple popper phenomenon. You know, people have lost sort of patience sometimes and really just want actions. But that's where I think a lot of the harm out th that's done out there uh, stems from. You know, you want an image. You want to have get a good idea of what's going on here. And you know, I'll even urge all the orthopedists. It's not it's not necessarily that you need an MRI right away. You may want to get an X-ray. An X-ray can give you a lot of things to work with. And nowadays, you know, with insurance anyway, you probably need to X-ray uh, to get the authorization. So you're not. It's not necessarily that you are. Uh, doing something completely useless, you know. There, um, there's no doubt that most soft tissues are isodense to, uh, you know, muscle and don't really stick out. But X-rays may find calcification. You know, you have uh, findings. You know, so on the left, uh, upper left image here, you have. Um, let me see if I can get the pointer again. Yeah. That's okay. I, I don't know if you can. Can you see my mouse uh, screen? Okay, wonderful. So, you know, this is calcification in the posterior uh, knee area and the soft tissue. We call these flibulates, and um, they tend to occur around uh, vascular malformations like hemangiomas. So if I felt a big mass in the back of the knee and I was, uh, I was worried, and I hear a history like, hey, you know, fluctuates in size. Sometimes when I'm active, it really gets engorged like, like most vascular tumors do. Uh, you know, I'm already doing a different show where I say, okay, well, let me just get a quick x-ray and see what's going on. I, I'll need to rule out that this is not a bony mass anyway, right? And I need to make sure that there's no bony erosions or any kind of injury to the bone anyway. So it's worth it to get the x-ray. You'll find maybe, you know, in a younger person, you have a very specific, well-circumscribed, rounded, uh, you know, calcification, as you see on the upper right. You know, that's a classic sign of myositis ossificans. Maybe with a remote history of a kick, maybe the patient has a, is an athlete and gets a lot of injuries, uh, you know. And then some of the more deeper, um, you know, palpated larger masses, an x-ray such as the one on the bottom will show you some erosions in that bone where you see, you know, remodeling with the tibia and the fibula, and you know that there's something very aggressive occurring. So, uh, you know, on the bottom... The, getting that x-ray sort of says, hey, you know, I really do think you need to 
get an MRI because you've, you've got obvious changes. More examples of myositis and foot cancer, not always, you know, uh, easily uh, appreciated with a round uh, structure. Sometimes where the muscle originates or inserts, you get these sort of uh, elongated uh, calcified, um, you know, x-ray findings. So uh, again, it's what it comes down to, even if you see the flea bullets, uh, these classifications within the soft tissue, you're not necessarily going to say, well, that's going to be for sure hemangioma or a benign tissue. You, you don't know. You know, sarcomas, like a synovial sarcoma, has uh, x-ray calcifications within it too. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mean to make things complicated in terms of what you can and cannot diagnose with x-rays. Uh, I'm just saying that it really helps with the differential diagnosis sometimes. And so, and, and even moving forward to the biopsy, my mentors always used to say, you know, before you send the, the patient for a biopsy, you, you ought to have a good differential and the biopsy should really just sort of hone in on one of, uh, of a couple of diagnoses you may have. Uh, again, here, large soft tissue mass in the back of the knee, uh, I got the MRI and you can sort of see uh, that it's um, you know, vascular malformation. Now, traditionally or historically, ultrasounds were pretty good for this, uh, but it becomes sort of obsolete with the, uh, with the push for more MRIs and, you know, CT scan findings. Uh, you know, ultrasounds can still be a reasonable option. I consider them every time I have a young kid that I, you know, if otherwise, you know, I would have to sedate to get an MRI or a CT scan. So just to even find out what exactly is going on, uh, you can get an ultrasound, you can size it. You can use ultrasounds as interval ways to just keep an eye on a on a lesion. You 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 don't have a, a big reason to be concerned, but you want to at least make sure it's not growing in size. Ultrasound offers a great option in regards to that. CT scans, you know, these are these studies have been around way longer than MRIs, but most of us orthopedists have become very familiar with using an MRI, and that's because we're looking at joints, you know, uh, tendons, and so many ways. For soft tissue definition, it's ideal. It may not be ideal for soft tissue assessment. Our general surgery colleagues or our surgical oncologists who also work with, uh, with the sarcomas tend to be uh, more comfortable reading CT scans and can confidently tell you some things that I would feel better you know, picking up on MRIs. You know, there's no doubt for some appreciation of vascular thrombus and vascular proximity to the tumor, um, the CT scans are the way to go. But really, you know, for better definition, uh, the MRI imaging, it's the choice, uh, the modality of choice for this, it's sort of the gold standard. I uh, say sort of, because again, with most musculoskeletal tumors, we tend to rely on the MRI, you know, and, uh, and, and it sort of helps guide us with further, uh, you know, advice, in, uh, as, you, as you'll see, the, the next steps, um, you know, the MRI go hand in hand. MRI imaging is so valuable and now has been characterized so well that you kind of have an idea exactly what to expect. If I think it's lipoma, I know that it's bright on T1, darkens with fat-saturated lesions, uh, fat-saturated sequences. You know, I have an idea of exactly what to expect with each type of tumor. Uh, hemangiomas are different. Hem uh, hematomas act differently on MRI from from some of the other discrete lesions, fibrous lesions. So without being redundant, the MRI with contrast is your gold standard. Uh, it's you know low risk. It doesn't have the radiation associated with CTs. High yield helps you understand the contrast itself is very important for potential surgical planning. You have an idea of the vascularity. You can embolize. You can make surgical plans. It's the way to go. More importantly, you know the MRI can be very helpful. Once they've studied it, the musculoskeletal radiologist can plan a, a, a route of a biopsy or an approach for the biopsy. That's usually done by our radiologists these days with an image guided, such as the one on the right, CT scan. You know, they, we, they have a brief chat with us about how we should approach the tumor and how they should be biopsied. Usually it should be, you know, along the line of the resection. You know, I, I put in the slide all the time because people seem averse to want to use contrast. They think, you know, contrast generally means more, more toxic situation for the patient. But gadolinium has been known to be much less toxic than some of the CT scan contrast. So it's, it's less of a problem. But I'm not saying that nobody has any allergies to gadolinium. 
but you're dealing with a much uh, less toxic uh, substance than CT contrast. Biopsy principles have always been the same with, uh, with the, you know, with managing tumors. Be aware of the neurovascular bundles. Talk to your uh, surgeons that can uh, give you some guidance in terms of um, how we would resect this tumor to begin with, uh, what to avoid, what structures, the, the tendons and so forth to avoid when you're going through the biopsy tract with the needle. You know, avoid transverse resections or incision, sorry, more longitudinal along the uh, axis of the incision. These are very important to avoid contamination. This is not only for bone resections, this is for soft tissues resections. You know, uh, as musculoskeletal tumor sur um, surgeons, my colleagues and I sometimes get referrals for unplanned resections and exposed uh, sarcomas from unplanned surgeries. And, and really this has a lot to do with, you know, how it was biopsied, whether it was incompletely excised, you know, excisional biopsies have their role, you know, particularly with a small lesion, you know, you palpate a small lesion, you got an MRI, you think, you know, from the MRI, there might be a lipoma or a cyst or a nerve sheet tumor, you know, you, um, you want to do an excision, that's fine. You want to get all of the lesion out. You don't want to do an intralesional thing, uh, excision. That's where the MRI makes a big difference. I want you to know the full extent of the lesion, you know, know the boundaries so that you can do a resection that uh, is less uh, detrimental. I'll finish on that note. Uh, you know, I just want to share a recent case. While there may not be, uh, you know, an example, and I don't want this to be an example of any type of wrongdoing, you know, if there's a lesion, uh, there was a lesion recognized on this toe, thought to be a very small, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it was thought to be, but it was excised by an outside surgeon and the tissue came back a very malignant skin-based uh, dermal malignancy, which, you know, when you look up tends to be, you know, considered highly malignant and was, um, you know, recommended that we do an amputation. We had our pathologist uh, review the, the, the studies and we found that it was not necessary to do a malignant lesion, uh, to do um, uh, an amputation. We studied the MRI. I, I studied the MRI very closely with our radiologists, and we were able to do a wide excision and have our plastic surgeon colleagues do, uh, an, uh, you know, uh, a synthetic and uh, bovine-based uh, dermal substitution, and they they closed it, and patient is doing well. So a lot of that is just sort of about doing the right thing from the beginning by imaging it. Young man presents with a big lump on his arm. Uh, you know, the exact again the. The, the doctor pimple popper I think to do is is to make an incision right there and sort of make it pop out and um, and try to submit that as a you know and say you got the job done but really you're better off taking care of the patient by getting an MRI seeing the full extent of this thing and excising it on block like this and uh, you'll stay out of trouble so I know I'm running a little over here uh, Dr. Rapp is uh, ready to uh, discuss. Uh, his lecture. Uh, thank you for your patience, and I'll be around to answer questions at the end. Thank you again for your attention. Great. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for that. I think that was a very interesting talk. And, uh, you know, if I could say, uh, I think if, if you could take two things away from that is you'll be, you'll never be faulted to um, a get the appropriate imaging of a patient and you'll never be faulted to get a biopsy um, for a patient. So, um, you know, to, to do a knee jerk reaction, like, Hey, I'll pop it out for you. As you had mentioned is, is, is not always the right thing to do and frequently can get you in trouble. So staying out of trouble, get the right imaging, get a biopsy, know what you're dealing with. And uh, always, if you're in an institution where you have colleagues who do this, consult with them uh, and then potentially refer if needed. So uh, Dr. Timothy Rapp, who's the, the chief of orthopedic oncology at NYU, associate professor of orthopedics, will be uh, discussing metastatic bone disease and uh, how to initially evaluate and manage uh, patients with these uh, sometimes complicated and uh, difficult uh, uh, lesions. So go ahead. Uh, thanks, Kareem. Um, hi, my name is Tim Rapp. Um, as Kareem said, I'm Associate Professor of Orthopedics at NYU. I'm here to talk to you about uh, metastatic bone disease. Um, 
you don't need me to sit here and tell you that cancer is common in our society. Um, these are relatively up-to-date facts uh, that haven't changed much over the years. I first created this talk, you know, 25 years ago when I was a resident, and I've modified it as we've as we've all got older, but um, really this slide hasn't changed much. Uh, currently, there's a little over 8 million Americans alive with some sort of cancer. Uh, obviously, 2008 was 14 years ago, but I looked up the numbers recently. They haven't changed much. Every year, there's a little over a, a new <clears throat> or more than a little over a million new diagnoses of cancer in the country. And in 2008, it was the second leading cause of death uh, in our country, secondary to cardiovascular disease. So since it's so common, um, you know, patients, uh, you know, live with their disease, uh, sometimes for long periods of time. And when they do, they can often end up with metastatic bone disease. Uh, it's the third most common site of metastasis, that being the skeletal system um, uh, behind the lung and liver. And it's estimated in autopsy studies anywhere between uh, 20%, at least uh, clinically, and again, at autopsy, even up to 50% of patients um, have some evidence of metastatic bone disease uh, at the time of death. Uh, so as I've mentioned, it's the most common bone ne neoplasm. Um, so not surprisingly, just doing the statistics, the most common primary tumors to metastasize the bone are the ones that are most common in society, mainly prostate, breast, lung, and kidney. I mentioned 20% of the cancer patients uh, at some point will develop skeletal metastasis. And of those 20%, uh, that do develop metastasis, it's estimated about 15% will end up with some sort of pathological fracture. So, you know, you don't need to be a mathematician to kind of crunch the numbers down and realize that this is a pretty common uh, orthopedic condition, certainly in terms of um, malignant bone tumors, um, orthopedic oncologists and even orthopedic surgeons often talk about, you know, osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, chondrosarcoma, which are definitely worth talking about, but are much, much um, less frequent than metastatic disease. Therefore, for a general orthopedist out in practice in the community, you need to have a good understanding of this and potentially how to work it up and maybe even treat it. So uh, this slide got a little um, enlarged, but anyway, the, the point of it is that um, particularly in today's world where there's all sorts of new uh, targeted therapies, just because somebody has metastatic disease does not necessarily pretend that it's a death sentence. Uh, obviously, a lot of it depends on the uh, type of primary tumor, um, the grade of it, and many other factors. So this is just a general slide to show that patients with metastatic prostate cancer to bone often have very long life expectancies, even more than 90% at five years. Uh, lung cancer, you know, as we all know, more aggressive, um, less five-year survival. But nonetheless, even that is changing with these new immunotherapies and targeted therapies. So I would be surprised over the next 10 years if these numbers uh, improve from where they were. I'll skip this in the interest of time. Uh, let me go back to this. So how, how do metastatic bone tumors present? Um, it's a variable X-ray um, presentation. Um, you know, depends on um, the type of primary tumor. Um, so there's not one x-ray that I can show you that's like typical. So I show you a, a few um, different um, presentations here. The upper left corner is a AP pelvis of a woman with metastatic uh, breast cancer, where you see that kind of mixed lucent and blastic lesion throughout her pelvis and proximal femurs. Below that, a lateral x-ray of the hip of a gentleman with metastatic um, prostate cancer, which is very blastic. Uh, in the middle, there is a metastatic renal cell uh, tumor that um, looks uh, very lytic, very lucent. And then a similar appearance in the paratrochanteric region on the far right of the lung metastasis. So the bottom line is anybody that presents to you with a... Uh, unusual, painful lesion over the age of 40 um, certainly should be worked up um, for the possibility of having metastatic disease, even if they don't carry a primary diagnosis. So how do you do that? I mean, orthopedic surgeons may be called on to do that. You might get a referral from a primary doctor for somebody with shoulder pain. They see this lesion, the radiologist is unclear, you're out in the community and it ends up in your office. Um, and that's not a, you know, a crazy scenario. I see it, you know, a couple times a month at least. Um, so even if you're in a general orthopedic practice or even a sports medicine practice out in the community, 
It would not be surprising for somebody over the age of 40 that gets referred to you. You get an x-ray, you see an aggressive lesion or just a, a lesion that's, um, you know, not diagnostic, um, that doesn't fit the benign criteria that Dr. Misruha talked about. You have to have some uh, armamentarian in the back pocket to figure out how to work this up. Um, so the first things that come to mind with a destructive lesion in anybody over the age of 40 is metastatic disease. Second on the list would be uh, myeloma or some other uh, lymphoid type malignancy. And then third way down the list would be some sort of primary bone tumor like a chondrosarcoma. Um, again, much less common than metastatic disease. So how do you work it up? Uh, you know, back to med school 101. I mean, sometimes these patients come in and they do have a remote history of some sort of cancer that was kind of forgotten about, or it was years and years ago, it was 20 years ago, somebody had um, breast cancer that had been followed for five years, and they think they're out of the woods, and they present with a new problem that always um, is important to take a good history. Physical examination, believe it or not, um, is uh, important. Uh, sometimes these patients will have palpable abnormalities uh, throughout their body. I don't see many orthopedic surgeons, including myself, doing full body exams like breast and prostate exams, nor do I think that we <laughs> necessarily should. But nonetheless, uh, there are studies to show that even just a good physical examination can identify the prime or you know, can point you in the right direction of where the primary tumor is um, just with the physical exam. Laboratory analysis, um, sure. So somebody comes in, they have a destructive lesion, you worry about metastatic disease, uh, what do you, you wanna do? Um, obviously, you get a battery of labs, just looking at the overall general health of the patient. Probably the most important uh, one of these, of, of any, would be a serum protein electrophoresis. Uh, that's a test that we use um, in the protein to look for monoclonal spikes to diagnose multiple myeloma. So, you know, although, you know, we all get regular, just general labs, uh, serum protein electrophoresis may be the biggest bang for your buck, uh, because if it's positive, you know, you have the diagnosis, you can refer it to a hematologist and, you know, depending on what their orthopedic issue is, it can kind of be uh, tabled, no need for a biopsy, at least acutely until they get their medical situation, uh, a little more under control. Um, so how do we work up again, continuing on this workup of an unknown primary, obviously the patients are going to have the x-ray of whatever painful limb it is that brought them in. Um, it's reasonable to get a whole body bone scan to look obviously at the lesion that you're concerned about, but also to see if there are other, um, subclinical lesions that are of interest uh, to you as an orthopedist. And if the above workup is all uh, negative, uh, a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis can pick up about a third of the primary tumors that uh, were undiagnosed prior to you seeing the patient. So chest CT, obviously looking for lung uh, lesions, abdominal CT can pick up uh, various things, usually a kidney disease, what we're most interested in. And uh, pelvis CT, I've seen a few patients come in where they are diagnosed uh, with bladder or even sometimes uh, colonic or GI cancers um, just by getting a CT. And these patients had no idea that um, that was going on with them. Um, again, I just talked about this in the interest of time. I think I'll skip it. Dr. Um, Woldy talked about uh, biopsy, so I'll kind of breeze through this too. But uh, we do do biopsies of these um, of these lesions if we cannot identify a primary tumor. So somebody comes in again, concerning lesion, you do this big uh, workup, uh, labs and x-rays and can't find a primary tumor, then you wanna do a biopsy, uh, to see if we can identify what it is and where it's coming from. Uh, if there's a large soft tissue mass, this can be done with a needle. Uh, if it's a, a strictly confined to the bone, um, as Dr. Wolde talked about, you wanna follow uh, basic techniques to be sure. And the off chance that it is a primary bone tumor like a sarcoma that you don't uh, burn any bridges. So once you make a diagnosis of uh, metastatic disease, how is it treated? Uh, I think the three of us on this panel would say over, over time, less and less are we doing surgery. I think a lot of that is because a lot of these patients are identified earlier and there's better non-surgical uh, treatments for them. Uh, radiation therapy um, has a palliative intent, so it's not curative, but it's very powerful in improving the quality of life in terms of uh, pain relief and preventing fracture, particularly if you can get the patient into radiation um, prior to them sustaining a fracture, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. 
Uh, they have long um, duration of responses, and um, it's very powerful in terms of reducing uh, patients' pain. The one thing that is well new in the last 20 years, and there's multiple studies, um, to, uh, you know, in, in real medical journals, New England Journal of Medicine type articles talking about the use of bisphosphonates, um, which we all know are pyrophosphate analogs that kind of uh, keep the osteoclastic enzymes at bay. Um, so these have been studied in multiple tumor types now and have been shown to reduce fracture risk, uh, reduce the pain associated with bony metastasis. Um, it, they're kind of handed out um, very frequently uh, within most cancer centers now. There is the possible side effect. Everybody talks about osteonecrosis of the mandible, but uh, that incidence is actually very low. And when you're dealing with somebody with metastatic uh, bone cancer, um, most people accept that small risk. So once we've made the diagnosis, um, and you're trying to decide on who to triage to radiation or, you know, they are on bisphosphonates. How do you decide, you know, who really needs surgery, who can, who can wait, you know, what, what do we do? Um, really, there's no rigid criteria for, um, for the upper or lower extremities, although on the next slide, I'm going to talk about this uh, Morel's criteria, which isn't a rigid criteria. You know, sometimes I get this similar talk to the residents and, you know, the next time a patient with metastatic disease comes in and they talk about this Morel's criteria and they want to give me a number and these numbers are not rigid. It's more of just kind of a, a guideline to use in terms of um, who you might consider operating on. Uh, for any spine surgeons that may be listening to this, the real indication for a spinal intervention would be for some sort of progressive neurologic decline. Um, and the pelvis lesions, uh, intractable pain or a fracture with a reasonable life expectancy is, is um, an indication to proceed with surgery. But <clears throat> as I'm going to talk about briefly, you know, many of these things, there's no long-term large prospective studies to tell you who you should or shouldn't operate on or what exactly you could do, should do because the problems are so variable. This is this Morell's criteria, which I mentioned. Again, um, the residents sometimes get focused on these numbers. Basically, this is an old article, uh, but it's been repeated, and I, I think it's more the principles of the, of the criteria than the hard numbers. So this Dr. Morell, I think, was a British surgeon. He basically, it's pretty you know, straightforward, common sense type information. He just said, okay, well, where is the lesion? How much pain are they in? Which is obviously very subjective, depends on the patient. Um, as we all know, some people have <laughs> really severe pain and they wouldn't tell you and, and vice versa. Uh, but also the type of lesion, is it blastic like those prostate best met, uh, and breast metastasis that I showed you, or is it really aggressive uh, lucent lytic lesion like a, like a lung cancer? And then the size, so pretty straightforward stuff. Um, so it just makes sense that lesions in the upper extremity that have mild pain that are relatively small, that turns out to be metastatic disease, are probably not ones that are going to go on to break. That's what we're trying to do as orthopedic surgeons, is not just do unnecessary surgery, but to do surgery on people that we can help by preventing a pathological fracture. Contrary to that, there are things that are around the hip that have severe pain. You know, these are patients that come in sometimes even in wheelchairs or, you know, limp in on a keen and they're on pain medication and they have a large lucent lesion in the paratrochanteric region. You know, their score, if you add them all up, is going to be higher. In the real world, it seems like the problems sometimes often group in the middle, and that's where you have to use your, your judgment in terms of the health of the patient, uh, what type of surgery you're planning, and other variables that are hard to, hard to really study. So once you decide somebody does need surgery, what do you do? If somebody comes in with a fracture or a lesion that has you know, severe pain near the hip, rather than doing some sort of... Um, fancy um, internal fixation uh, that may be doomed to fail, the indication there would be for some sort of resection and replacement. The most common thing I'm thinking of would be a femoral neck lesion. Is it really worth trying to pin that and radiate it and wait to see how they do? Uh, probably not. In that instance, it's probably best just to go straight to a hemiarthroplasty or total hip. Um, versus lesions that are more in the diaphysis, whether it's the um, uh, femur or humerus, uh, and even paratrochanteric lesions, you know, below the lesser trochanter, uh, generally I treat, and I think most people treat those with some sort of intramedullary nail, cephalomedullary nail, and then post-operative uh, radiation um, to prevent the disease from progressing. 
pelvis and acetabulum, as I talked about, these are often big surgeries. So you want to just carefully screen your patients to be sure you think they're, um, you know, going to benefit uh, after they recover from such surgery. Um, so, and again, there's no rigid, strong, and you know, criteria of who is and who isn't. I think that's a gestalt. Um, and it's a very gray area, understandably, and it hasn't changed much over at least the 20 plus years I've been looking at this stuff. Here's an example, like I said, of the proximal femur and the femoral neck, big lesion, painful. Uh, this is not something that, I mean, you know, you could, you could put screws in it. It's a lesser procedure, but do you really think that's going to work um, long term? Probably not. Renal cell cancer also is one that's usually refractory to a lot of treatments. So this would be one that, you know, in this case, this is an old slide. We did a, a HEMI, but I think total hip arthroplasty if the patient has a reasonable uh, life expectancy. Proximal femur, I kind of talked about already. So here's this example I showed earlier of this paratrochanteric involvement, you know, kind of this moth-eaten aggressive appearance. Patient has functional pain. Um, this was an old recon nail that I did even as a fellow. That's how old this talk is. But, um, you know, the point is fix the, uh, fix the lesion and also fix the uh, femoral neck and head, even though there's not a lot of disease there. And use a long nail that goes all the way down to, towards the knee to protect the uh, femoral shaft from any potential future disease. Uh, here's the same concept here with a femoral diaphyseal lesion. You see this lytic lesion, painful lesion. Uh, the idea here would be, again, um, some sort of intramedullary device. I typically put some sort of cephalomedullary device in to avoid the problem of the last slide. Is say this patient lives for many years. You don't want to, two years later, put in a standard anti-grade nail and then have them have a big femoral neck lesion and kind of be stuck on, on what, you can, what you can do. Want to make your life easier. Uh, Supercondylar and condylar fixation. We do see these from time to time. These again, close to the joint. Do you do a big implant? Do you do cement and plate construct? Uh, either is reasonable. Um, I've done both and, you know, go back and forth. Again, I think it depends on the patient. How sick are they? What are their expectations? What is their function like? Uh, there's various kind of retrospective studies talking about the results, which are all okay. But again, either is a reasonable option. I think it depends on your practice and what you're used to and, and what the patient's expectations and goals are. Same, same idea with the humerus. Here's a mul multiple examples of various lesions in the humerus, proximal humerus and distal humerus. This patient over here on the far right, um, you know, has very minimal disease. That might be somebody you consider radiation for. A diaphyseal lesion, like in the upper left, that might be one I'd consider uh, or a, uh, a nail and some sort of cement construct to fill up the defect, which we do from time to time. And then these proximal humeral lesions, the one with a fracture would be difficult to, it's not going to heal with a plate and screw construct. So you might consider some sort of resection and replacement, even though it'd be good for pain, but the function will not be great. Uh, the middle example might, you know, without a fracture might be one that you do consider a plate and uh, cement. Again, there's no strong, uh, strong recommendations for either. It just kind of depends on um, what you're comfortable with and uh, what you want to do. And these problems, again, if you're in New York City, you're probably going to be referring it to uh, a colleague or to a big center where it takes care of this. But if you're listening and you're out in practice, like in uh, my hometown with a regional med medical center for a farming community in, in Iowa, you may be called on to do this sort of thing. You're not going to be able to necessarily refer all those patients on. So um, the good things to keep in mind. As I mentioned, spine a metastasis. Um, uh, I doubt there's many spine surgeons sitting here listening to this, but uh, if they are, for your own knowledge, I mean, to me, the only real indication for a spinal instrumentation is for, is for progressive uh, neurologic decline that's failed, um, failed medical and, and radiation management. These obviously can be big surgeries. This is old stuff, you know, where they, we used to use cages, but, you know, these are front back procedures that are long, complicated, uh, bloody. And so you want to be sure, kind of like the pelvis cases that you screen uh, very carefully. Um, so I think that's it. Maybe we'll see if there's questions from the uh, from the audience for any yeah. of us. Hi. Yes, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, there are a few questions from the audience, so I think um, I can get us started with some of them. Uh, so I'll start from the from 
in chronological order. So the first question is, um, do osteochondromas ever occur from secondary to a trauma? Um, or, or are they just uh, something that's developmental? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, generally, no. Osteochondromas, I mean, they, they can be familial. There are um, traits, but generally they're uh, idiopathic, singular findings, uh, not thought to be due to trauma. The thing we think about with trauma is myositis, so that's not an uncommon situation. Somebody has a I mean, the classic like test question and teaching thing is it's a young athlete gets, gets kicked in the quad, has a big hematoma, and then three months later presents with uh, the solid mass. And it's just basically the hematomas become calcified and become, you know, we call it myositis ossificans. So generally, no, we don't think of osteochondromas as being related to trauma, but there definitely are conditions that um, can present as musculoskeletal tumors that are trauma related. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that's a question that I frequently get from patients and uh, their parents as well. Uh, you know, is it, you know, because everyone wants to know what, what caused this. So they want to know if they could have prevented it. Um, and sort of on the same theme, uh, so can uh, an asymptomatic osteochondroma become symptomatic uh, secondary to trauma? I can, I can definitely say that uh, most recently yesterday. So a patient with a, a painful osteochondroma that was fractured after a trauma, and that can be very painful. Um, you can also have uh, irritation of overlying bursa or tendons or muscle. Um, another patient that was seen a couple of weeks ago ended up having the osteochondroma taken out, um, had a lot of pain uh, as it was uh, pushing, pushing up against the adjacent muscle uh, as she was running and uh, had severe pain in one, at one point, um, even though the osteochondroma had been stable and present for a couple of years. And uh, uh, hadn't been causing any pain. So yes, trauma can um, uh, cause them to be, become painful and you may, may prompt you to treat. Um, I've even seen a couple of them fracture. I mean, uh, <laughs> people that have known that they've had them, but it never really bothered them. And, you know, some sort yeah. of trauma, usually it's a sports thing and they, they'll break and they're painful. And you, yeah. the couple I've seen of that, I've just excised and not waited for them to heal or see what happens. Yeah, I agree. Um, that this was one I saw yesterday is already booked for that. And, um, you know, sometimes you can have an osteochondroma for years and years. Um, now, Tim, you remember that, that patient I presented last week, uh, uh, she has MHE and had this large, uh, osteochondroma for years, hasn't changed in size and doesn't look, uh, uh, like it's, uh, uh it's, uh, concerning or doesn't have any concerning features. But uh, over time, she's developed this really uh, large bursitis in that area. It's become very symptomatic. And um, so, so eventually these can, can cause, uh, cause the symptoms and, and uh, prompt you to take them out. Do any of uh, you uh, do surveillance for your patients for MHE? Or do you just sort of symptomatically, you know, if you have any symptoms, come back? Or, or do yeah. you make them do tests? I think, I think for the more... Um, Central lesions that may not be uh, palpable, I, I, I would get uh, sort of more, more regular surveillance. The question is, you know, how frequent, how frequently are you going to do that surveillance? Is it annual every other year? Um, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's difficult to tell. Yeah, I mean, is it worth it to image the pelvic ones? Tim, do you do that at all? The pelvic ones I do um, because you can't feel them. And, yeah. you know, often those are incidental. And if they're symptomatic, you know, I, I just have a conversation with the patients and, you know, recommend it. How many of them actually, you know, usually they're young people and how many of them actually really do. I, I don't know, but I think that's wise to recommend that at least for certainly for the ones you can't feel or yeah. see. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question, uh, Hanok, maybe you can get it. It's, what's the implication of, of a fixed soft tissue mass versus something that's freely movable? Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, again, I find it very difficult to group them just based on these little physical uh, characteristics. But, you know, I, I know that mobile you know, and soft compressible lesions are tend to tend to be benign. Fixed may mean that it's actually bigger on the inner side and you don't know if it's had any adhesions to the fascia below or the, or the bone. So you're more inclined to want to image that soon rather than, you know, uh, just clinical observation, you know, so 
um, you know, a lot of patients come in, you know, they, they tell me, you know, I may be working up something else. And they tell me, hey, I got this little thing here too. And I, and I ask, well, does it bother you? Has it grown? Uh, and, and then they say, no, then, I, then, you know, listen, if it's been there and it's not causing any pain, I, I don't necessarily need to get an MRI, particularly if you're here for another reason, you know, it's not like, hey, I'm, I'm all right for this and I'm all right for that. Um, yeah. So maybe a fixed lesion that uh, is, is immobile, maybe, you know, depending on the pain, if it's symptomatic, if it hurts, I would be very inclined to at least getting an MRI. I mean, uh, listen, we, as doctors, we're supposed to be a little system aware. We don't want to waste um, resources, uh, unnecessary MRIs and so forth. But sometimes getting an answer for that quickly is, uh, is very reassuring. And uh, I don't know necessarily that I think a fixed uh, mass is, um, is anything uh, terrible. You know, again, yeah. you get all the... It's, it's, I guess, one, one indication of, out of many that you might observe uh, that, that, that may prompt you to, to be more concerned rather than less, I think. Uh, I but, but alone, standing alone, probably uh, not sufficient, but, uh, but definitely would, would check off a box uh, to, to make you more alert, um, I think. Uh, and so, so it's, it's, uh, its value is, is limited, but it's something that we do note, I guess, you know, soft tissue sarcomas tend to be firm, firmly firm and, and fixed. Um, uh, the, the issue about symptoms though, you know, with soft tissue masses, it's, it's tricky because the vast majority of soft tissue masses are asymptomatic, uh, even, even in the most, most aggressive kinds. And, um, unlike, unlike bone sarcomas, which are, are painful. Um, so that's, that's another thing. So, uh, uh we have another question, uh, regarding when, when patients are referred to a musculoskeletal oncologist with a suspected tumor, um, does the MRI always have to be with and without contrast or, or not? I mean, I think if it's a mass, I really think you ought to uh, do that with and without contrast. I mean, I think it's one yeah. less thing. Uh, so if, if you're worried about, uh, you know, a mass a growth, something in that regard, in that realm, I think you should. And, and really you have no reason to be worried too much because I know we're all sort of inclined to hesitate Oh, it's an IV, you know, my patient may not want an IV access, you know, they don't want to be injected with contrast. Again, contrast has a stigma of, of being a problem. This, again, that's why I think it's worth it to learn about gadolinium a little bit. It's, it's one of the more benign, you know, you don't have to be worried about iodine allergies or kidney toxicity. They, I mean, relatively speaking, compared to CT, MRI, you know, they, they'll tolerate the gadolinium more than the they'll to tolerate the CT contrast. So 100%. I vote in favor of getting with and without contrast. You, you'll only be doing, helping the patient. If it's a mass, if it's a lesion, if it's an infection, with and without contrast, uh, absolutely. And then along those lines, I think it's important to note that if you, if you uh, uh, see a uh, bone lesion, let's say in the proximal tibia, um, I, I wouldn't get an MRI of the knee. I would get an MRI of the tibia it, to try to get an MRI of the whole bone. Um, I think that's important. You get to uh, see the intramedullary extent frequently um, that's not appreciated on an X-ray. And so if, if you are getting an MRI of that bone, get an MRI of the whole bone. Uh, and a knee MRI or a shoulder MRI should almost never be done for a bone tumor. You're more, you're more likely to need a humerus MRI, a tibia MRI, or a femur MRI, depending on the location. Um, and I think that's an important thing to note because that'll save uh, you know, the uh, costs, it will save time and uh, uh, get the patient uh, to the right spot earlier. Um, there's a physical therapist who sent us a question um, uh, asking us when, uh, you know, what's, what sort of, so I'll, I'll phrase it exactly. So what can you tell physical therapists to like, look out for as when to refer out for possible suspicion for cancer, what is considered re as reasonable suspicion? I think that's an important question, especially from a physical therapist, because I can say, I don't know about you too, but I can say that, uh, frequently patients are, uh, or patients come to us because they said a physical therapist um, palpated something during therapy, uh, for an, an other, another condition and, uh, asked, uh, to ask the patient to be seen. Uh, frequently these are tumors around the back, posterior thigh, calf areas that, uh, patients may not necessarily palpate on their own. Um, so, uh, what do you think? What, what, what would you recommend, uh, to a physical therapist about what's reasonable suspicion, um, 
maybe start with Tim. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, if, if it's um, a mass that you're palpating, um, you know, depending on where the patient came from, I would say have recommend to them that somebody evaluate that. And, you know, I would, if it's a referral from your local primary doctor, you might even want to pick up the phone and, and give them a call because you just don't want to overlook anything. That said, um, for every sarcoma that's out there, there's probably 200 ganglions and Baker cysts. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, throw the patient into extremists by scaring them, but I would, you know, just advise them, you know, uh, as a professional that you're not sure what it is, probably nothing, but it's worth, you know, somebody, look, somebody looking at and probably imaging, but that's, mm -hmm. You know, I'm speaking as an orthopedic on, oncologist. The, the other thing is pain. Uh, if you're a therapist, you're probably more used to hearing about people's pain than even, than even the surgeons are. But pain related to at least bone tumors usually is a different sort of pain than what you're going to be used to from tendonitis. You know, tendonitis pain is usually activity related. It's kind of usually, you know, NSAIDs are your your ice, you know, what are your ultrasound, you know, it usually calms it down, doesn't bother them at night, but bone pain, whether it's metastatic disease or a primary bone cancer that maybe you'll see once in your career, it's severe pain. I mean, it's night pain, waking people up at night. Um, it's not just kind of walking in off, you know, going to have my shoulder looked at, not that that's not important, but it, it's a different quality. It's a different level of pain. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very well put. Uh, I think that that sort of uh, how the history that the patient gives you, uh, I think, is extremely helpful. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, I think as Dr. Rapp alluded to, you know, having a low index of, you know, low, low threshold to, um, to express con some, con some level of concern that it needs to be looked at, uh, but not, not necessarily uh, make the patient very, very uh, anxious at the same time. Um, so there's another question regarding biopsying peritrochanteric tumors. So uh, this is a very specific scenario of a peritrochanteric uh, hip fracture in a patient with a known primary, but no previous biopsy in, of bone showing bone metastatic disease. Uh, how do you biopsy? Is it a lateral cortical window? Um, is it, do you, do you open up the GT <laughs> before putting a nail and uh, scraping some stuff out? Uh, what, would, what would your approach be? Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, this is a classic, like, uh, board question, and it does come up, you know, I've seen it a few times, believe it or not. I mean, if the patient doesn't have no metastatic disease, uh, widespread metastatic disease, if it's just a history of breast cancer, lung cancer, even if they're getting active treatment and they weren't known to have bony metastatic disease, I would say, yes, that patient definitely needs a biopsy before proceeding with any sort of internal fixation like a nail. And in my hands, I would probably do a direct lateral approach and somehow get through the fracture and into the lesion and take a pituitary and just take, you can do it through a very small, small longitudinal incision. And uh, if you have a good pathologist, send a frozen section. If not, just tell the patient, you know, we need to make sure we know what we're dealing with before we proceed, because you can really, you can really make a, a bad situation worse if you proceed and, um, just throw a nail in somebody and it turns out to be a chondrosarcoma and you know then the then the horse is really out of the barn at that point absolutely absolutely yeah and that lateral cortical window is probably the best approach because again if you whenever you perform a biopsy you want to think about what am i contaminating um is it through the approach that's going to be potentially used if this was a sarcoma and um you know is it or is it going to be something that uh is going to make the approach very difficult or potentially uh, impossible and so, yeah, th that lateral cortical window is probably your best, uh, your best access point. And as Dr. Rapp said, you can do it through a very minimally invasive approach um, directly through the fracture into the lesion. Um, make sure you have lesional tissue. So I would say even if you were sending for a, def a, a permanent you know, biopsy um, that you weren't going to proceed with, for example, nailing, if it turns out to be a carcinoma, um, I would still send... Um, frozen section, just so that the pathologist can tell you, is this lesional tissue or not? Because sometimes, you know, you think you're in the tumor, you think you got, but I think getting, uh, and, 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 you know, a lot of people may, may skip this step saying, oh yeah, I, you know, I can, I can basically recognize, you know, what, what's tumor and what, what's uh, hematoma or, or normal bone. 
but I think you know it's if 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 you don't you always see this, I think it's it's worthwhile if there is a pathologist at all uh, to get a frozen section. Just make sure that you actually sent uh, tumor lesional tissue, um, and then and then you can decide either you're going to proceed with bio, with uh, nailing if if it's definitely a carcinoma or uh, if it's unclear, then you can close and uh, uh, wait for another day uh, to take care of this patient. Contrary to that, um, you know, and the residents sometimes get confused. If somebody has known widespread metastatic disease, you know, throughout the body, liver, brain, you know, whatever the primary is, in those patients, I personally, I might send a frozen, but I don't wait uh, for a permanent uh, pathology result in those patients who are clearly, you know, headed um, headed towards hospice or something. I, I don't, I don't do that. But it's more for the patients that maybe have a remote history. No known metastatic disease come in with a fracture and you want to assume it's from their lung cancer. I wouldn't assume that. Absolutely. No, that's, that's a very good point. So pra practically speaking, yes, it's, uh, uh, it's something that, you know, you don't want at the same time, uh, uh, to prolong, uh, suffering from, for a patient who's, who's, you know, uh, in pain from a pathologic fracture, you want to get them, um, fixed and, and, and moving as quickly as possible. Cause that's, the best way that they can uh, get to uh, their systemic treatment as well. Uh, most of the systemic treatment for these diseases requires them to be functional. Uh, if they're bed bound, uh, they, they may not uh, may not even receive it. Yeah, <clears throat> practically speaking, if the patient was an older, a much older patient in eighties, uh, you know, late seventies, and I I, uh, I have strong suspicion that it's metastatic. I do take the specimen myself and ask the pathologist, you know, look to see if there's any cartilage at all and mm -hmm. make sure that it's not, obviously the differentiated chondrosarcoma doesn't look like cartilage sometimes. So you can always sort of, I understand it always pays to be patient and to sort of get that specimen in early. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes there is a dilemma. It's not so straightforward. If you have a, some, a patient in their eighties with, you know, advanced prostate cancer, not yet, diagnosed in the skeletal system, you talk to the family and, and they may find that, you know, like a, a proximal femoral resection or a total femur and someone that age group is probably mm -hmm. not that likely. So I sometimes do take a, a, the aggressive option of going to the OR, getting a biopsy, going to the frozen section room, which is very close in our, in our case, and making sure I don't see an overt car cartilage, you know? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the last question I have here is regarding bone graft. Uh, so for, I guess they're referring to um, after curtage of benign bone tumors. Um, what's what's the choice of grafting? Uh, uh, Tim, what what do you usually use? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I mean, we could have a whole seminar on, on that. You know, bone graft substitutes and options. And um, honest, you know, I'm not trying to. It's a great question. Is it metastatic disease? Is it a giant cell tumor? Is it a little finger inchondroma? I mean, definitely bone graft substitutes. The calcium phosphate substitutes are in wide use. They're expensive, so it depends on your hospital whether or not that's reasonable. For small little lesions, I think that's fine. For big defects, if you're, you know, say one of those humeral lesions that I showed with metastatic disease and the patient's going to live and you know, do I really think just putting a little flimsy humeral nail in there is going to hold? Probably not. So that might be something I'd open up and not going to heal either. So I might put methyl methacolate in that. So it's all, it's a good question and it's hard to give you specific, uh, it's kind of a case by case thing, but there are multiple options. And um, uh, I think it depends on the size and, and what you're treating. Oh, absolutely. Uh, how about you, Hannah? Yeah, uh, I always, uh, it's a dilemma for me, especially like metastatic lesions. I never know if I should be doing cement or bone void fillers. Um, so, you know, around joints, I, I try to do cement and then bone void fillers somewhere else where I think there's a good chance of it healing, particularly with uh, radiation and so forth. So mm -hmm. it's tough. I don't think I'd add anything more to it than, uh, than Tim yeah. just said. Uh, it's, it's, I think for... Um... For metastatic lesions in general, uh, I've used uh, uh, bone cement, so polymethyl methacrylate. Um, again, because as, as to mentioned, you know it's not going to heal, and so sometimes if you can if you can get a whole bunch of cement in there and then up and down the canal, fix it with a plate or put a nail down. Um, you know, and with the plate you can put screws through the cement and it just feels very rigid immediately. Yeah. 
um, you can get a good result. It's just that, you know, sometimes that's a larger approach than a nail. Um, with the benign bone tumors, uh, the ones I, I included uh, were from, you know, my cases. Um, I, you know, as you know, I've been using uh, a bone substitute of uh, calcium sulfate and calcium phosphate. Um, I don't have any conflicts uh, to disclose uh, with, the, with the producers of that, but uh, that's, that's what I, I've been used to using and I've uh, been pretty happy with it. Uh, it tends to resorb over time faster in younger patients than in older patients and uh, gives it gives you some initial structural integrity as, as you noticed i i don't use that many uh, that much hardware in uh, benign bone tumors following curettage and grafting so i feel like it's been uh, it's, it's served me well uh, but as dr rat mentioned they, these, these are expensive um and, and that should be taken into consideration depending on uh, the hospital system and, uh, and and the added cost to that procedure Great. So I think we have one more. And um, so wh whoever is interested in spine uh, is asking this question. Uh, what's, optimal, what's the optimal TLSO to stabilize METS or primary tumor of thoracic or lumbar spine? Same for metastatic spine fractures. So um, what, what are your thoughts? What sort of bracing do you provide these patients? I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'll, you know, be honest, I'm not a big bracer on anything. I just think it kind of slows the patient down and doesn't really do them much. Although I will say when I was a fellow resident, we put like anything thoracal lumbar and a TLSO and, you know, how often it got worn or whatnot. I don't know. I mean, if they're in bad pain, you know, I sent them to radiation. I didn't mention kyphoplasty, which is an option um, in our institution. As far as I know, I think the neurosurgeons do that, but most, you know, institution variables, sometimes the spine surgeons will do that. Um, so that's an option. I just, just my own personal practice. I just don't find them very practical and they really, patients hate them. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> no, I completely agree. Uh, that's been my experience as well. Um, you know, you, you have to find, I mean, I've yet to find the patient who can tolerate a, uh, an LSO, um, you know, for, for, for lumbar di metastatic disease. And, uh, so usually following a kyphoplasty, as you mentioned, uh, you know, patients do pretty well and, um, they, they, they don't usually need to, to be, to be braced for any extended period of time. So, um, you know, my so when you say feeling, LSO, do you mean the sort of the, uh, the, the, the hard plastic clamshell type? or the, um, the sort of uh, Velcro-based corset type? Because the, the ones that I've used, one is a little more tolerable. It, it is, it is. I, I tend to use the Velcro, Velcro one, but it is very rigid and it does go fairly low into the sacrum and, um, and, and patients hate it. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of referring them for kyphoplasty or... Or yeah, some kind of ablation and you know cementoplasty type of procedure. Absolutely, and they tend to do extremely well. Uh, you know, I think I think it may be overkill in some of these patients to to brace them following that procedure. And there's literature to support kyphoplasty. It's one of the you know mm -hmm. I should probably incorporate that into this talk. So I think whoever asked the question, yeah, kyphoplasty is definitely beneficial for patients with painful compression fractures. Kyphoplasty it helps them significantly. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think we may be just over our time, but I think that was a really great discussion. Um, I think we went over many topics. Obviously, we could spend hours and hours going over these things, and hopefully that was a reasonable summary for everyone. Um, and I thank everyone for joining, and uh, I thank everyone who supported the uh, the tech side of things. And uh, uh, I hope that we can do this again uh, next year with some updates and uh, thank you again.